No one know anything about it except one man, the prophet. Did he know that because he was a prophet or because he had a time machine? Do you know the box that we make on top of the camel? The box that has two or four seats for women to sit inside during our long travels, right? This box will be moving on its own without the camel, imagine? Not only that, this box that will be moving alone, it will have lights on it. Also at that time in the future, a man will get out of his house, go far away from his family, and he will talk to something in his hand or something on his thighs. And these things will talk back to him and tell him about what his family are doing. We found a historical document confirming these events. It is called the Ipoer Papyrus. A man will be sitting and trials are being presented on a grid in front of him. A grid that has vertical and horizontal lines, like Hasir. And after this sad incident, the female goddess Isis cries every now and then. Her tears are the raindrops that they witness. When a few hundred people who were being persecuted in the middle of nowhere, after a few years, became the rulers of more than half of the world. And here is an article published in 2012 by the University of Oxford saying the same thing. Because the earth under them will spit out its wealth. Something will come out from under the surface of the earth that will make them extremely rich very quickly. Prophet Noah was not a drunk. And Prophet Lot did not sleep with both of his daughters every night until he impregnated both of them. All of the stories in the Old Testament are a fabrication. Do you know the dishes that we use for food and laundry? I saw these dishes communicating with each other. She said, the Prophet of Allah died in my lap. Praise be to Allah who mixed my saliva with his on his last day in this world. Salam alaikum. Time machines are part of science fiction movies and novels. They are just a part of human imagination, right? But did you know that there is one man in all human history who actually had a real working time machine? And he actually used it several times and provided a lot of evidence for that. Evidence that you can see and examine right now. This video will be divided into four parts. The Prophet's time travel journey to our time. The Prophet's time travel journey to his near future. His time travel journey to the past. And finally, his time travel journey to the hereafter. It doesn't matter if you have a little bit of doubt in your heart or completely disbelieve in Allah and his messenger. If you have the patience to sit down and fully watch this series until the end, you will not have an atom's weight of doubt and the mountain's weight of faith and devotion in your heart in the end. The prophecies are a lot, and I have to read them very quickly. Thus, these videos will require your full attention, so bring your coffee, and let's start. The first time travel journey the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him took was to our current time. He traveled from the 7th century to the 21st century, took a look around what's happening in the world, and went back to his disciples to talk about what he witnessed. Now imagine yourself as one of the Prophet's disciples, sitting in a camp in the desert in the 7th century, hearing his stories about what he witnessed when he time traveled to the future. Ready? Let's start. At that time in the future, people will stop riding on animals and there will be no need to ride on horses or camels. Do you know the box that we make on top of the camel? The box that has two or four seats for women to sit inside during our long travels, right? This box will be moving on its own without the camel, imagine? Not only that, this box that will be moving alone, it will have lights on it. People will be riding boxes that have two or four seats and have lights on them. Yes, it was very impressive. Also at that time in the future, a man will get out of his house, go far away from his family, and he will talk to something in his hand 
or something on his thighs. And these things will talk back to him and tell him about what his family are doing. A man will communicate with his faraway family using something in his hand or something on his thighs. Can you believe that? At the time in the future, dishes will communicate. Do you know the dishes that we use for food and laundry? I saw these dishes communicating with each other. But if you think that will help people become closer to each other and communicate more often, you're wrong. Although they have the means to communicate over far away distances, people will actually do the opposite. People will cut their family ties. People will also cut ties with their neighbors, unlike now where everyone knows each other and talk to each other. No. People will only greet their friends and pretend that everyone else doesn't exist. Imagine? And regarding women, oh, what will happen to women? At that time in the future, the percentage of women will be more than the percentage of men. And there will be a great movement of women, a great fitna, a great protest against the commands of Allah to them. A test from Allah to every woman at that time. If you live until that moment, tell your women to be aware of it. At the time in the future, women will get out of their houses and they will be doing business like men. Imagine? They will not stay in their houses like they do now. At the time in the future, women will find a way to be clothed and naked at the same time. They will be publicly sexually seducing everyone while being dressed. Those women are cursed and will never smell the fragrance of paradise. At that time in the future, most people will be drinking a lot and they will be calling their drinks with different names. Adultery will be everywhere. Some people will even commit adultery in public places exactly like what donkeys do. They will have no shame. They will not even try to hide it. At that time in the future, there will be a lot of babies born outside of marriage. Huge number of babies will be born as a result of adultery. At the time in the future, people will go back to the sin of the people of Lot, the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. Men will love men and women will love women. At the time in the future, diseases will appear that you never heard of before. At the time in the future, the very poor Arabs will suddenly become rich out of nowhere because the earth under them will spit out its wealth. Something will come out from under the surface of the earth that will make them extremely rich very quickly. After this event, they will compete in building very tall buildings. The buildings of Mecca will surpass the mountain tops, imagine? And all of that will happen suddenly. At the time in the future, people will have the power to break mountains, even remove them completely from their places. People will remove a mountain from a piece of land to use it for different purposes. At the time in the future, people will have the power to pierce holes in rocks, to make tunnels, roads and water channels inside the mountains and under the surface of the earth. Imagine? At the time in the future, the Euphrates River will dry up, Iraq will be denied its wealth, and Egypt will be denied its wealth. The wealth will be in Arabia while the neighbors will be living in poverty. How will that happen, O Prophet of Allah? It will happen after foreign intervention. At the time in the future, the pen will be widespread. See now how the percentage of people who can read and write is less than 10%? And even those who can read and write, there is nothing for them to read, right? At the time in the future, the majority of people will be able to read and write, and there will be an abundance of material to read. The message of Islam will be accessible from all over earth. But at the same time, people will become more ignorant and more deluded for some reason. People will listen to idiots and get their knowledge from them. People will have a hard time differentiating between truth and lies. Lies and false testimonies will be widespread. People will trust the traitors and will disbelieve the trustworthy ones. There will be public speakers whose whole career is based on mocking and making fun of others. At that time in the future, most countries will be ruled by its hypocrites. Police forces will be everywhere. People will be torturing each other. A man will be given a choice between being oppressed or being a sinner. 
if you are given that choice, choose to be oppressed over being a sinner. At the time in the future, riba will be everywhere. Interests. The majority of humanity will be dealing in debt, interest and loans. This will be very widespread to the extent that even if you don't deal with interest, you will be affected by its dust. It will harm you anyway, whether you do it or not, just by existing in a country that deals in riba. At the time in the future, kids will be treating their parents in a completely different way than what we're used to. Now kids respect and completely obey and serve their parents until they die, right? But at that time in the future, a mother will give birth to her own master. Children will become so disobedient and filled with rage, you will find the mother like a servant to her kids, not the opposite. At that time in the future, a lot of young people will become extremely rich. You will find young men and young women who will gain abundant wealth somehow. At that time in the future, moralities will be very rare and people will be using foul language all the time. Foul language will be the normal language. Bribery will be widespread. Prayers will be abandoned. Even murder incidents will be a lot. You will even see destruction of whole civilizations. At the time in the future, mosques will be decorated in a very nice way, but the hearts will be corrupted. At the time in the future, musical instruments will be very widespread. Musical instruments will be even literally on people's heads. Imagine people wearing musical instruments on their heads and walking around with it. That's very weird. At the time in the future, unfortunately, there will be some of my own ummah who will pretend that musical instruments are halal. And they will give fatwas to people saying that it's okay to listen to music from my own ummah. At the time in the future, fitna, trials, will be a lot. A man will be sitting and trials are being presented on a grid in front of him. A grid that has vertical and horizontal lines, like Hasir. Every time he consumes one of these trials, it leaves a black spot in his heart. Until his heart becomes filled with black spots that he doesn't care anymore about what's good and what's evil. At the time in the future, things will happen much quicker. What usually takes us years, for example, they will do it in a month. At the time in the future, marketplaces will be everywhere. Not like now, as we have one marketplace per city. No, marketplaces everywhere, and they will become very close to each other. But take care, because the people controlling those marketplaces will be the worst people. At the time in the future, rainwater will not be pure anymore. Rainwater will be contaminated for some reason. Islam started as being ignored by most people. Then Allah will strictly adhere to it. Then at that time in the future, it will be ignored once again. Lucky are the ones who will stick to it at that time. There will always be a group of my followers who are sticking to the truth. They don't care if everyone else leave them or ignore them. The more you go in the future, the more you will see evil spreading. At the time in the future, you will find believers hiding their belief in Allah. The same way you see hypocrites now hiding between us. At the time in the future, you will find real believers weak and humiliated. At the time in the future, ignorance and delusion will be extremely widespread. The truth will be blurred between the lies. And there will be tests like pieces of extremely dark night. A man will be a believer in the morning and a disbeliever in the evening. People will sell their religion for a little bit of worldly pleasures. That time in the future is called the time of patience. Anyone who sticks to his religion at that time will feel like holding to a burning piece of coal. But Allah will reward these people 50 times more than the reward that you get. They asked, O Prophet of Allah, do you mean 50 times the reward of normal men from their time? He said, no, I mean 50 times the reward that you get for what you are doing right now. I really missed my brothers. They said, aren't we your brothers, O Prophet of Allah? He said, no, you are my friends. My brothers are the ones who will believe in me without seeing me. Do you want to hear something that you cannot imagine? At that time in the future, 
you will be huge in numbers, but very weak in power. But, O oh Prophet of Allah, that cannot be. Military power is determined by the number of people. For example, an army of 10,000 is stronger than an army of 5,000. An army of 1 million men is absolutely stronger than an army of half a million men. How come we will be huge in number, yet weak in power? That doesn't make any sense. We can't imagine that ever happening. My friends, the fact that power is determined by numbers is just a fact of our time. In the future, the rules of power will change. Things will happen that will make my huge ummah very weak. Also, at the time in the future, you will have diseases in your heart. You will start to love the pleasures of this life and you will care less about the hereafter. Allah will remove the fear from the hearts of your enemies and they will divide your territories the same way people divide a shared dish before they start eating it. At the time in the future, a lot of Muslims will be just copies of Christians and Jews in their lifestyle. They will copy everything that they're doing, good and bad. Even if they enter into a hole of a lizard, you will enter with them. At the time in the future, you will have deceiving Imams. People who are pretending to be Imams while deceiving Muslims into doing sin. Believing it's a good thing. Maybe you will find fake Imams who will tell you that you should ignore Hadith. Or you will find fake Imams who will tell you that women should lead in prayers. Or even fake Imams who are supporting sodomy or fake Imams who are claiming that bank interest and music are halal. Or fake Imams who are saying we should do takfir on everybody and divide our ummah at every opportunity we find. Or fake Imams who are saying we should honor our nationality more than we honor our brotherhood as Muslims. Who knows what will happen? At the time in the future, you will find young Muslims doing sin in groups, not hiding while sinning. If you look at any of their faces, you can't see any signs of the fear of Allah. At the time in the future, you will be divided into a lot of sects. The same way the people of the book got divided. All of these sects are destined to hellfire except one. The one that sticks to our beliefs and teachings without changing anything. At the time in the future, there will be a group of people who claim to be Muslims, but they reject all of my teachings and rulings. A man from them will be sitting on his couch, not making any effort or research, saying, I don't care what the Prophet said, I only take my teachings from the Quran alone. Imagine, at the time in the future, the children of Israel will be gaining power again, and they will corrupt in the land again, as they did before. And they will fight you, but in the end, you will triumph over them. After that time in the future passes, the Antichrist will appear. The Dajjal, and also the Mahdi, and also Jesus, the son of Mary. When the Dajjal tries to enter Medina, he will find my small humble mosque turned into a big white palace. He will look at it from far away and say, see this big white palace? This is the palace of Muhammad. Then Jesus will defeat the Dajjal, break the cross, and kill the pig and end Jizya. One last thing. The Qur'an that you have right now will remain uncorrupted, unchanged, untouched until the day of judgment. No matter how hard your enemies try, no matter how weak you become, it will never, ever be corrupted. Not even one verse of it. Here are the references for all that I have said so far. You can find all of these in Qur'an, in Al-Bukhari, Muslims, Sahih al-Tirmizi and others. The majority of them are straight sahih and some are narrated from enough sources to be trusted. You can pause the video to read them. Now, let's go back to our beautiful camp in the desert in the 7th century, listening to our beloved Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, talking to his disciples. If you were one of the disbelievers back then, you would have a lot of doubt. You will say something like, O oh Muhammad, all of these prophecies you are saying are in the very far away future. We will not discover whether you are saying the truth or lying for hundreds of years, maybe thousands. If you really want us to believe you, you should use 
this time machine that you have to tell us about future events that we can see with our own eyes. Go to the near future and tell us what will happen. This is the only way we will believe you. Okay, no problem. I will tell you everything that will happen in the upcoming years. See this man, Abu Lahab? He will spend all of his life as a disbeliever and he will die as a disbeliever. But O Prophet of Allah, what if he came after one month or a year or even seven, eight years and say, I believe now? He might even pretend to be a believer just to prove you wrong. You know how much he hates you. He might temporarily say, I am a believer, so people will think that you're a liar and destroy the whole message. Don't worry, he will not. I'm not speaking from my own knowledge. Every word I tell you is a revelation from Allah, and I am 100% sure he will neither believe nor pretend to believe until he dies. And you know what? Neither will his wife. Both of them will end up in hellfire. And if he does, then I am a liar. But, O Prophet of Allah, that's a huge risk. Again, I told you, it's not a risk. I'm not making predictions. I know the future because Allah is the one who is telling me about future events. And this is exactly what happened. Also, have you heard about the ongoing conflict between the Romans and the Persians? Yes, O Prophet of Allah. Since Heraclius took charge, the Roman Empire has been on a decline in power. They are losing land and about to reach dissolution. We predict that the Persians will win the war very soon. That's a fair prediction. But I tell you, the opposite will happen. The Romans will defeat the Persians. Not only that, but also this defeat will happen in less than 10 years. O Prophet of Allah, everyone is predicting the Romans to be defeated. And if the next 10 years pass and the Romans didn't triumph, no one will ever believe you again. You give a specific deadline to your prophecy. Don't worry. It will happen. I told you I'm not making predictions. I got this information about future events from Allah, who is all-knowing, all-powerful. And this is exactly what happened. Now let me ask you, what do you think will happen to you and all your Muslim brothers in the near future? O oh, Prophet of Allah, most likely the disbelievers will keep attacking us, killing us slowly until we cease to exist. Why do you think that? O oh, Prophet of Allah, we are weak. We are hundreds in number. The pagans and the disbelievers are constantly attacking us. And they are tens of thousands. Not only do we have a disadvantage in numbers, but also we don't have the weapons and horses like them. We know that there is no way we will survive this, but we decided to die for the sake of Allah, His Messenger, and His religion. We will be with you until the end. He said, Do you think Allah will not support you? Let me tell you exactly what will happen. It doesn't matter if you are few in numbers and equipment. Numbers and equipments don't grant victory. Victory is only from Allah. It doesn't matter if they have huge armies. It doesn't matter if they have the best shields and weapons in the whole world. Allah is with you and Allah will support you. You will have your honor back and you will enter the holy mosque in Mecca and you will perform worship there. All the tribes of Arabia will not be able to kill you, no matter what they do. You will be victorious over the pagans and Allah will open Mecca for you. And that will be very soon in my own lifetime. People will be joining the Brotherhood of Islam in groups. Then Allah will open Yemen for you. There will be no fear at all. A man will travel all the way between Yemen and Mecca. He will not be worried about anything except Allah and maybe a wolf that might attack his sheep. O Prophet of Allah, what you're saying is impossible. How come a couple of hundred men be victorious over all the pagans of Arabia while all of them are allies to each other? They will defend each other and they will attack us and easily kill all of us. I told you Allah is all-powerful. Nothing and no one can prevent his will. Wait until you hear the rest. Not only you will prevail over the Arabs, but also you will defeat the Persian Empire and you will defeat the Roman Empire. O Prophet of Allah, when you said we will defeat the Arab pagans, we said maybe there is a small chance. But Persian Empire and Roman Empire... Both of them have armies of hundreds of thousands. They are the biggest two superpowers in the whole world. How can that be? 
Listen to me. You will have the treasures of Kisra, the king of Persia, and you will open Constantinople, the capital of the Roman Empire. The end of these two superpowers will be on your hands. Don't say it's impossible. Nothing is impossible if you have Allah on your side. O oh, Prophet of Allah, our brains cannot encompass how will that happen. But we believe Allah and we believe you with all our hearts. And this is exactly what happened. Until now, historians cannot wrap their head about this specific miracle. When a few hundred people who were being persecuted in the middle of nowhere, after a few years, became the rulers of more than half of the world. Overcoming their persecutors, the pagan Arabs, then overcoming the two biggest and strongest superpowers at that time. It is exactly like saying that a group of 1,000 men in Nigeria right now conquered the whole world, including United States, Russia and China in a couple of years. It is an unbelievable miracle that cannot be described otherwise. Anyway, let's go back to the 7th century again, exactly to the Battle of Badr. Just before the battle started, the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, pointed to a place on the floor. He said to his disciples, in this exact spot, Abu Jahl will die. And in this spot, this man will die. And in this spot, this man will die. And this is exactly what happened. After the battle was over, every man he talked about died in the exact spot he pointed at. Another interesting incident. Before the battle of Al-Khandaq, Muslims were few in number and were being attacked by nearly all the tribes of the pagan Arabs together at the same time. Their hearts were pumping so hard out of fear, all they can see with their eyes is inevitable death. And they started to dig a trench to defend themselves against the pagans trying to survive. While they were digging the trench, there was a huge rock made of a very solid material that just refuses to be broken. No matter how many men hit it with their axes at the same time, it doesn't break. So they called the Prophet to ask him what should we do with this rock. He came and he took his axe, alone. He hit it one time, it broke a little. He said, Allahu Akbar, I was given the keys of Asham. Asham, by the way, is what we call today Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan, all of this area. Then he hit the rock one more time, it broke more. And he said, Allahu Akbar, I was given the keys of the Persian Empire. Then he hit it the third time, it completely broke. And he said, Allahu Akbar, I was given the keys of Yemen. The disciples were preparing themselves to die and to be defeated once and for all, while the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, was saying they would rule all the countries outside of Arabia. Imagine the confidence. Another interesting incident, the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him predicted that after all of these victories, there will be a time when there will be no poor and no one will accept charity because no one will need charity. And this is exactly what happened during the time of Omar ibn Abdul Aziz. Callers were walking the streets all over the cities in the Muslim world, looking for someone to take charity, anyone, they couldn't find any. Looking for someone who has debt to pay off his debt. Anyone? They couldn't find any. Looking for orphans who need help. They couldn't find any. Looking even for someone who wants to get married. Do you want to have a house, free house to get married in? And they couldn't find any. So the Khalifat Umar ibn Abdul Aziz ordered them to buy birds food and throw it on top of mountains. So no one will ever be hungry. Not people not animals and not birds. Another interesting incident. Before the battle of Mu'tah, the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him, instead of appointing one leader, he appointed four, only this time. In other words, he prophesied the death of the first three. So he said, Zayd ibn Haritha should be your leader. Then after his death, Ga'far. Then after his death, Abdullah ibn Rawah. Then after his death, you choose the fourth one. And this is exactly what happened. By the way, this battle was against the Eastern Roman Empire. The Roman army was 200,000 soldiers and the Muslims were 3,000. I will talk about that in details in another video. 
Another interesting incident. One day during the battle of Tabuk, the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him commanded everyone to tie their camels and to prepare and brace themselves. And no one should even stand up the next day. They asked him why. He said because tomorrow there will be extreme wind. And that is exactly what happened the following day. Wind blew so hard, one of the narrators saw a man being blown away into the distance by the mountain. Another interesting incident. During the battle of Al Khandaq, the disciples saw a very courageous man fighting the disbelievers with power and devotion for the sake of Allah, until enemies overpowered him and stabbed him. While he was counting his last breath in the nursing tent, the disciples were jealous. They were saying, Lucky him, he will be in Jannah very soon. But the Prophet told them, No, he will not. Allah told me that he will be in hellfire. The disciples were shocked. How come a man who fights and dies for the sake of Allah be in hell? So one of them went to the nursing tent to check on him, see what's going on, why is he in hell? He was in very severe pain and he couldn't endure the pain, so he took his own sword and stabbed himself with it to end his life. When the disciples saw that, they said, Allahu Akbar, exactly what the Prophet said. Another interesting incident. The Prophet peace and blessing be upon him said that Allah will try to kill him, but Allah will protect him and he will not be killed. When the Jewish woman Zainab bint al-Harith put poison in grilled meat and gifted it to the Prophet and his friends, he ate from it and his friends ate from it. Everyone who ate from this meat died except the Prophet. The poison didn't affect him. Another interesting incident. The Prophet said that Umar ibn al-Khattab will be killed, Uthman will be killed, Abu Bakr will not be killed. And you know what? This is exactly what happened. He said that after the death of Umar ibn al-Khattab, there will be a division between the Muslims. And this is exactly what happened. He said that his grandson, Al-Hasan, Allah will use him to make peace between these two parties during the division. And this is exactly what happened. He said to Ali ibn Abi Talib, there will be an issue between you and my wife Aisha in the future. When it happens, take her to safety. And if you are familiar with the battle of the camel, this is exactly what happened. Years later, during the battle of Tabuk, the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him said, may Allah bless Abu Zar, Abu Zar al-Ghifari. He will die a lonely death. Fast forward years later, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was traveling near a place in the middle of nowhere called al -Rabda. He found a woman standing on the road asking for help. She said, my husband died and I need help burying him because there is no one here, we were alone and I can't bury him by myself. Turns out that her husband was Abu Dhar. He immediately remembered what the Prophet said years ago and he screamed, Allahu Akbar, the Prophet said the truth, the Prophet said the truth. Another interesting incident. One day the Prophet gathered his disciples and told them, let's pray for the king of Abyssinia. He just died right now. They gathered and prayed for him. Remember that at that time before the invention of telephone, there was no way someone would know the death of the king of Abyssinia in Arabia in the same day. It was as if he had a live stream from Abyssinia to Arabia. Live stream. Another interesting incident. Do you know Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira? He was one of the leaders of the pagans and a great source of evil. He was very rich and he was from a very wealthy family. And he was always bragging about his family, always boasts about how noble his father was, and uses his family power to oppress the poor. The Prophet peace and blessing be upon him said, he is not really the son of his father, he is the son of adultery. At that moment, Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira went back to his mother and asked her, Is what this man claiming about you true? She looked at him and said, I can't keep it a secret anymore. I never revealed this to anyone in my life, but you had to know someday. Yes, you are the son of adultery. This man, Muhammad, is telling the truth. And your father that you are boasting about every day is not really your father. How did he know? Another interesting incident. Directly after Al-Isra wal Ma'raj, the Prophet told the pagans of Mecca, I went all the way to Jerusalem and back to Mecca last night. 
they said that's impossible. It takes us month to travel from Mecca to Jerusalem and then back from Jerusalem to Mecca. And you're claiming that you did the two-way journey last night while we were sleeping? You're a liar. Then the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, told them, I can prove it to you. On my way back from Jerusalem, I passed by a caravan. They had a unique looking camel that looks like this and this. When I met them, their camel ran away from them and they lost it. So I talked to them and I told them exactly where their camel was. I also asked them for water and they gave me some. It will take them three days to arrive. When they arrive here in Mecca, ask them about these details. They said, we will wait three days to ask them and only then we will prove once and for all that you're a liar. When the carnival arrived in Mecca, they asked them about the Prophet's story and they said that was exactly what happened on their way back. Every detail the Prophet said was true, subhanAllah. Then they asked the Prophet for more proof, saying, if you really went to Jerusalem and came back in one night, tell us about Jerusalem. Tell us every detail, streets, marketplaces, shops, everything. He gave them every detail about Jerusalem they asked for. And they confirmed these details with merchants who traveled there often. And all of the details were correct. Then they said to the Prophet, we still don't believe you. You're lying, but we can't prove it. He said, what more proof do you want? They said, if you are a real messenger, ask your God to split the moon in half right now. He said, and then you will believe? They said, yes. He prayed to God to make the miracle for him and the moon was split in half and merged back again in front of their own eyes. Then they said, we don't believe you, you're just a magician. I will talk about that in details in the physical miracles video, inshallah, later. Now, let's focus on the prophecies. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, prophesied his own death. He said, I was given a choice between having an extended life to see the victory of my ummah or having a shorter life to meet my maker. And I chose my maker. When Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, heard this, he cried, expecting the death of the Prophet to be very soon. Then one day, the daughter of the Prophet, Fatima, may Allah be pleased with her, entered the room on him. He whispered something in her ears. She cried so hard. Then he whispered something else in her ears. She laughed and smiled. After that, Mother Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, asked her, What did he tell you? Why were you crying the first time and why were you happy the second time? She said, The first time he told me that Angel Jibreel came to him, revised the Quran twice, because he will die very soon. So I cried because I will miss him. But the second time he told me that I would be the first of his family to die after him. So I smiled and laughed because I was so happy that I would be with him very soon. Then the Prophet became extremely weak, laying down with his head on Mother Aisha's lap. She was softening his toothbrush with her saliva and then giving it to him to brush his teeth. This was when he looked up at the sky and said, I choose the higher companion, I choose the higher companion. This is when Aisha understood that the angel of death was giving him a choice between life and death. She said, the Prophet of Allah died in my lap. Praise be to Allah who mixed my saliva with his on his last day in this world. And he said the truth one final time because his daughter Fatima was the first to die after him. Here are all the references of what I've said so far. You can find all of these in the Quran, in Al-Bukhari, Muslim, Sahih al-Tirmizi and others. The majority of them are straight Sahih and some of them are narrated from enough sources to be trusted. You can pause the video to read them. After Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, proved to the disbelievers that he either was a prophet of God or he had a time machine, now it was time to face the people of the book. This was a big challenge because to prove himself to these people, he would have to use his time machine to travel to the past to get their information about previous civilizations. You know, the people of the book were known to be the people of knowledge in Arabia. They had great knowledge of the nations of the past the stories of the prophets, 
the stories of righteous people and they didn't share this knowledge with the pagan Arabs as they were looking down at the Arabs because, you know, they were Gentiles. You know how Jews think of Gentiles, right? Anyway, they were always telling the pagans that very soon a prophet will appear in Arabia. And when that happens, we are the only ones who can test him and know if he is a real prophet or a false one. So it was time. They went to Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, and told him, If you are a real prophet, ask God to reveal to you the following stories. The story of Prophet Joseph. The story of the sleepers of the cave. The story of the great traveler. And the story of the journey of Moses and Al-Khidr. God revealed all these amazing stories to the Prophet with extra impressive details that left the Jews speechless. For example, not only did Allah reveal the story of the sleepers of the cave, but also Allah revealed that the rabbis of the Jews who were testing the Prophet's knowledge were actually arguing within themselves secretly over the number of the sleepers. They weren't actually sure if they were three or five or seven. Not only that, but he also told them more of their own secrets within their community. For example, after the Jewish woman tried to poison him, he gathered all the Jews in Medina and asked them, What is the name of your grandfather? They lied and said a wrong name because they were ashamed of their real grandfather. He was known to be a coward. Then he said, You are liars. He told them the name of their real grandfather, which was a secret. They said, How did you know that? Then he asked them, Now I will ask you another question, but this time you should say the truth. They said, Yes, we will say the truth, because it seems like if we lie, you will know it anyway. Then he asked them, Did you try to poison me and my friends? They said, Yes. He said, Why? They said, We poisoned you because we thought if you were a false prophet, you would die. And if you were a real prophet, the poison would not affect you anyway. And it didn't affect you. Not only that, but also he showed them how they corrupted their own books and fabricated parts of them claiming it's from God until their books became a mix of truth and falsehood that couldn't be differentiated from one another. We can't discuss all of them now, I will make separate videos about that later, but let's go over some examples quickly. Allah didn't rest on the seventh day as they claimed Allah doesn't need rest. Eve didn't seduce Adam to eat from the tree, and women are not punished by the labor pain for a sin that Eve did. That never happened. Prophet Noah was not a drunk, and Prophet Lot did not sleep with both of his daughters every night until he impregnated both of them. All of these stories in the Old Testament are a fabrication. Prophet David did not kill a man and sleep with his wife, and Prophet Solomon did not commit idolatry and did not practice magic. Mary was not an adulteress. She was a virgin and the birth of Jesus was a miracle from God and so on. What we need to focus on now are the historical information mentioned by the prophet which were recently validated using modern archaeology. I want to focus on those because it was impossible to know these details before the advancement of science. Except of course if you were a prophet of God or had a time machine. For example, the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said that Arabia in the past was green, filled with rivers and lakes. That was very long in the past before it became a desert. And here is an article published in 2012 by the University of Oxford saying the same thing. Satellite images have revealed that a network of ancient rivers once coursed their way through the sand of the Arabian desert. Did he know that because he was a prophet or because he had a time machine? Another example. The prophet peace and blessing be upon him said that the people of prophet Ibrahim were worshipping three gods. The sun, the moon and the third celestial object. Archaeologists just discovered this information in the temple of the ziggurat of Ur. The idea of three gods Nana, Shamash, and Ishtar, symbolized as the sun, the moon, and the third celestial object, is a recent discovery. This information was not available before the 20th century, because these temples were buried under the sand. This was a secret that was discovered by Sir Leonard Woolley. Did Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, know that because he was a prophet or because he had a time machine? 
Another example, the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him corrected two historical mistakes in the Bible regarding the story of Joseph. First is when the Bible claims that Joseph was sold in exchange of 20 shekels of silver to some Arabs outside of Egypt, while the Quran states that the sale happened inside Egypt to Egyptians. And now, thanks to archaeologists, we know that silver coins were only used in Egypt at that time period, not outside. Second is when the Bible claims that at the time of Joseph, the king of Egypt was a pharaoh, while the Quran states he was not a pharaoh. And now, thanks to archaeologists, we know that the Quran was correct. Did he know that because he was a prophet or because he had a time machine? Another example, the prophet peace and blessing be upon him filled a huge historical gap in the life of Mary that even the New Testament failed to fill. A question that the New Testament failed to answer. Why didn't the Jews kill Virgin Mary when they accused her of being an adulteress? It is in their law that adulterous women should be killed, or to be more specific, stoned to death. Why did they leave her? The Prophet peace and blessing be upon him told us the full story of the miracle of the birth of Jesus and how Allah proved the innocence of Mary to everyone, and how he spoke as a newborn to defend his mother's honor. In the 20th century, we found the Naga Hammadi scrolls, which contain the ancient writings of non territorial Christians. Writings that were long lost and buried underground. Writings that contain the same stories mentioned by the Prophet. These scrolls are now on display in the Coptic Museum in Cairo, Egypt. The question is, did Muhammad know about that because he was a Prophet? Or because he had a time machine? That is in addition to the overwhelmingly accurate details of the life of ancient Egyptians that were completely lost 300 years before the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him, and then rediscovered in 1799 during the French occupation of Egypt. During this period in the middle, no one knew anything about ancient Egypt. We couldn't even understand the writing before the Rosetta Stone. So no one knew anything except one man, Prophet Muhammad peace and blessing be upon him. For example, we learned from the Prophet that ancient Egyptians had a religious belief that the sky cries tears on them. Now, thanks to Egyptologists, we understand that they believed in a number of gods. Briefly, one of them killed the other, and after this sad incident, the female goddess Isis cries every now and then. Her tears are the raindrops that they witness. They even had a festival every year called Laylat al nukta that celebrates the cries of the sky. Did he know that because he was a prophet or because he had a time machine? Another example. The Prophet peace and blessing be upon him told us that in ancient Egypt, they persecuted criminals by cutting their limbs first and then crucifying them. Historians actually thought the opposite. They thought that crucifixion was only in Greek and Roman cultures, and ancient Egyptians never did it. But thanks to the modern research of Egyptologists, we now know that not only did they crucify their criminals, but also they used to cut their limbs first before crucifying them. Exactly what the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said. How did he know that? Did he know that because he was a prophet or because he had a time machine? Another example. We learned from the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, that the body of the Pharaoh of Moses will be preserved as a sign to humanity. The problem was, at the time of the Prophet, the body was long gone. It was hidden in the sacred valley of kings. His mummy was only discovered in 1881. You really need to think about this. The mummy was hidden from thieves by the Egyptian priests 1000 BCE. This is 1700 years before the Prophet. This hidden location was discovered in 1881. That is a total of 2,881 years where humanity had zero information about this body. No one knew anything about it except one man, the Prophet. Did he know that because he was a Prophet or because he had a time machine? Even the French scientist, Dr. Maurice Bosset, the scientist who was in charge of examining the body to determine the cause of death, when his research concluded that this specific pharaoh 
died drowning, he was shocked. And he was lucky to take his shahada and become one of the Muslims. Indeed, Allah preserved this body as a sign for humanity. A sign to learn from, a sign to guide us towards the truth, not towards more arrogance and more denial. Another example. We learned from the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, that the Pharaoh of Moses claimed to be God. He asked people to worship him. That is very unlikely for the rulers of ancient Egypt because they had this belief in supernatural gods like Isis, Osiris, Horus, and Ra. Now, thanks to the work of Egyptologists, we can understand from the temple of Abu Simbel that Ramses II had no regard for these gods, especially Ramses II. He even put a small statue of the god Ra next to four huge statues of himself in the entrance of the temple. In other words, I am four times more powerful than your gods. This temple also contains a picture of Ramses II making a sacrifice to his divine self. Did Muhammad know about that because he was a prophet or because he had a time machine? Another example. The Bible claims that in Egypt, the number of people who believed in Moses were 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. So the total, if you add the women and children, will be one or two million people. But the problem is, the same book of Exodus says that the Pharaoh appointed two women, Shiprah and Pua, to deliver the babies and kill the boys of all of these people. How can two women only deliver and kill the babies of two million people? While in the Quran, it says that the believers who followed Moses were a few which makes more historical sense. Another example. The Bible claims that Moses encountered the burning bush when he was 80 years old, and two pharaohs ruled Egypt during that time. But we learned from our beloved prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, that he was 40 years old, not 80, and there was only one pharaoh, not two. Now we know, thanks to the amazing work of the Egyptologists, that there is no 80-year period during which two pharaohs ruled Egypt. Any 80 years period will give you at least three pharaohs in power. Thus, the biblical story is impossible. It is historically inaccurate, while the story in the Quran fits all the historical evidence. Did he know that because he was a prophet or because he had a time machine? Another example. We learned from the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, that Pharaoh asked his chief engineer to make him a telescope to look at the sky and try to find the God of Moses. That was very hard to understand as we assumed that ancient Egyptians didn't have the technology yet to make telescopes. But thanks to the work of Egyptologists, now we can actually see with our own eyes the Marchat. The Marchat is the first telescope made by a man in history and it was made in ancient Egypt. It is now presented in the Museum of Berlin. So did he know that because he was a prophet or he had a time machine? Another example. When the Bible mentioned God's punishment of the Egyptians before the Exodus, it mentioned bloody Nile, frogs, mosquitoes, flies, dead animals, and skin disease, but it failed to mention the most important punishment, the first punishment that led to all that, the flood. We learned from the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, that all of these punishments started with the flood. The flood explains these seemingly random and unrelated punishments. Listen to this explanation for more details. A flood would result in high concentrations of red earth entering the Nile River and causing a blood-like color, killing fish and making the water undrinkable, as described in the biblical narrative. This phenomenon is attested to historically, as recorded by a Middle Kingdom Egyptian sage. See, the river is blood. One shrinks from other people and thirsts for water. The rest of the biblical plagues are also easily explained as a consequence of the flood. Frogs, mentioned in plague number two, are known to fill the land after Nile floods. The death of the frogs recorded in the biblical narrative can be caused by contamination of anthrax that was carried over from the rotting fish. Mosquitoes, mentioned in plague number three, proliferate after Nile floods, as the pools of water left over from the flooding would have allowed them to overbreed. 
swarms of flies, mentioned in plague number four, would be brought about by the massive death of frogs on the land. The death of pasturing livestock, mentioned in plague number five, can be explained by anthrax, as brought on the land by the frogs. The boils on humans and cattle, mentioned in plague number six, may have been caused by bites. The stable fly in particular is infamous for its vicious biting of mammals. We can see that the Qur'an's mention of a flood easily explains the biblical plagues, which are not random as initially appears to be the case, but in fact a series of interrelated events. Now thanks to the amazing work done by Egyptologists, we found a historical document confirming these events. It is called the Epoer Papyrus. It clearly states all of these punishments and authenticates them and it is currently in the Dutch National Museum. Did he know all that because he was a prophet or because he had a time machine? Another example. We learn from the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, that God created plants first. Then he created moving creatures and Adam was created near the end. Did he know that because he was a prophet or because he had a time machine? As usual, here are all the references. Pause to read them. Until now, we covered three time travel journeys that the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, made. One to our time, one to his near future, and one to the past. Now let's cover the last one, the time travel journey to the hereafter. Let's go back to our imaginary desert camp in the 7th century and listen to our beloved prophet talking to his disciples about what he saw. Friends, I want to tell you what I saw when I time traveled to the hereafter. In the beginning, there was an angel called Israfil, holding a trumpet. He blew in the trumpet and everything suddenly changed. The earth was shook so hard in a way that never happened before. Everything on it was immediately destroyed. No cities, no roads, no buildings, nothing was left. The land split open and every dead person was resurrected. Everyone, from Adam to the last day, their bodies were reconstructed and they emerged from their graves. قالوا يا ويلنا من بعثنا من مرقدنا هذا ما وعد الرحمن وصدق المرسلون. People were so confused and terrified, saying, "Woe to us! Who has resurrected us from our resting place? This is what the All Merciful has promised, and the messengers have spoken the truth." خاشعة أبصارهم يخرجون من الأجداث كأنهم جراد منتشر. Terrified as they were. They started to run randomly like swarming locusts. Then the sun expanded until it became so big, its edge became so close above us. Around the area where the moon is right now, it became extremely hot. But by the will of God, somehow people did not die. They stayed alive in the excruciating heat, running around looking for shade. فَإِذَا بَرِقَ الْبَصَرُ وخسف القمر وجمع الشمس والقمر يقول الإنسان يومئذ أين المفر كلا لا وذر But when the sight was stunned and the moon was dimmed and the sun and the moon were brought together on that day one will cry where is the escape but no there is no escape they ran looking for a mountain to hide behind but they didn't find any all the mountains were gone they became like soft wool يوم يكون الناس كالفراش المبثوث وتكون الجبال كالعهن المنفوش They ran looking for water, looking for oceans or seas, but they didn't find any. Some of them were resurrected in tiny bodies, some were as big as an ant. People were giants to them. These were the arrogant people. Some of them were resurrected blind and they said, God, why did you resurrect me blind? I had sight in my first life. And it was said to him, just as our revelations and signs came to you and you neglected them, 
So today you are being neglected. قال رب لما حشرتني أعمى وقد كنت بصيرا. قال كذلك أتتك آياتنا فنسيتها وكذلك اليوم تنسى. The severity of this day is unimaginable. Every nursing mother abandoned what she was nursing. And every pregnant woman delivered her burden prematurely. All of that out of fear. And I saw people as if they were drunk, though they were not drunk, but the torment of Allah was terribly severe. يوم ترونها تذهل كل مرضعة عما أرضعت وتضع كل ذات حمل حملها وترى الناس سكارى وما هم بسكارى ولكن عذاب الله شديد. What do you think happened next? You might guess that everyone was judged based on their deeds, right? Actually, no. Nothing happened. Nothing happened for a very long time. Do you know how long that day was? تعرج الملائكة والروح إليه في يوم كان مقداره خمسين ألف سنة. فاصبر صبرا جميلا. The angels and the Holy Spirit will ascend to him on a day 50,000 years in length. So endure with beautiful patience. I know that most of you think that standing in a line for one hour is torture. But... What I saw was that day was like 50,000 years of our time. الأخلاء يومئذ بعضهم لبعض عدو إلا المتقين. I saw close friends becoming enemies to each other. Each one accusing the other that he is the reason for his sins, blaming each other for their misguidance. إذ تبرأ الذين اتبعوا من الذين اتبعوا ورأوا العذاب وتقطعت بهم الأسباب. I saw people who followed their leaders and their celebrities blindly, fighting with them, saying, You are the reason we are being punished now. You are the reason we're going to hellfire. And the leaders said, It's not our fault. We didn't force you to follow us. وقال الذين اتبعوا لو أن لنا كرة فنتبرأ منهم كما تبرأوا منا كذلك يريهم الله أعمالهم حسرات عليهم وما هم بخارجين من النار. Then the followers said, if there were a second chance, we would have ignored you like you ignored us. We would disown you and never follow you, but it's too late. وإذا الموؤودة سئلت بأي ذنب قتلت, I saw baby girls who were killed by their own parents or buried alive being asked, why were you killed? What was your crime? يعرف المجرمون بسيماهم فيؤخذ بالنواصي والأقدام فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان هذه جهنم التي يكذب بها المجرمون يطوفون بينها وبين حميم آن I saw the wicked were being recognized by their appearance then were seized by their forelocks and feed to the hellfire not to enter it, not yet just to see it and see what will happen to them later. In front of Hellfire, the temperature was much, much higher than what they were experiencing before when the sun was over their heads. Every time they became extremely thirsty, they drank from extremely hot liquids that looked like molten lava. انطلقوا إلى ظل ذي ثلاث شعب لا ظليل ولا يغني من اللهب إنها ترمي بشرر كالقصر. It was said to them, you were looking for shades from the sun? Go look for shades next to hellfire. It has no shades and it does not protect you from the heat. On the contrary, it throws sparks. Each spark of them is as big as a fortress. إذا الشمس كورت وإذا النجوم انقدرت Then the sun collapsed and its light was gone and the stars also disappeared. And the people were left there for years and years, standing and waiting for their inevitable judgment. But it never came. They were between waiting and fighting with each other, blaming each other, blaming their leaders, blaming their celebrities for deluding them, and nothing happened. Then people started to find their families. I saw men running away from their own loved ones. يوم يفر المرء من أخيه وأمه وأبيه وصاحبته وبنيه لكل امرئ منهم يومئذ شأن يغنيه. I saw men running away from their brothers, from their mothers, 
from their beloved life partners and from their own children. Everyone was only worried about himself. He didn't care when his own children kept screaming to him, Help, father, please help us, father. Nothing. After years and years of waiting, some people started saying, I can't wait 50,000 years like this. Start the judgment, please start the judgment. One of them even said, start the judgment, even if I will go to hell. Just start it, please. I can't wait anymore. But there was no answer. They went to Adam, peace and blessing be upon him. They asked him to intercede with God to start the judgment. Adam replied, Nafsi, Nafsi. Today my Lord has become angry as he has never become before, nor he will ever become thereafter. He forbade me to eat the fruit from the tree, but I disobeyed him. So, I'm sorry, myself, myself. Go ask Noah for intercession. So they went to Noah, peace and blessing be upon him. Asked him to intercede, and Noah replied, Nafsi, Nafsi, myself, myself. Go ask someone else for intercession. Go to Ibrahim. So they went to Ibrahim, peace and blessing be upon him. And he replied, Nafsi, Nafsi. Myself, myself, go to someone else for intercession. Go to Moses. People kept looking for someone to intercede and everyone rejected them until they came to me. And they told me, Muhammad, you are the seal of the prophets. And God has forgiven your early and late sins. Please intercede for us with your Lord. Don't you see in what state we are? Then I went beneath Allah's throne and I fell in prostration before my Lord. And then Allah guided me to such praises and glorification to him as he has never guided anyone else before. Then it was said, O Muhammad, raise your head, ask, and it will be granted. Intercede, and it will be accepted. And I interceded, and only then judgment started. The rules were given to everyone. Everyone is going to receive a detailed record of their first life. Those who get the record with the right hand should not be worried. Those who get the record with their left hand should. People who know they were going to get the record with their left hand were so terrified. They actually tried to cheat their way out of it. Do you know what they did? They thought it was a smart idea to hide their left hand behind their backs and the right hand in front of them, trying to catch the record with the right hand while hiding their left. But actually what happened is, the record came from behind them, directly in their left hand, that they were trying to hide. فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِهِ فَسَوْفَ يُحَاسَبُ حِسَابًا يَسِيرًا وَيَنْقَلِبُ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ مَصْرُورًا وَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ وَرَاءَ ظَهْرِهِ فَسَوْفَ يَدْعُو ثُبُورًا وَيَصْلَى سَعِيرًا Those who got the record with their left, they were terrified. They tried to run away from the judgment. But they couldn't because everyone had both a driver forcing him to his destination and a witness making sure that he doesn't lie during the judgment. <laughs> Trying to defend themselves, they said, it's not our fault. It's the fault of my devil. He is the one who deluded me. The devil replied, no, I didn't delude you. You deluded yourself. And they started fighting with each other until it was said to them, قال لا تختصموا لدي وقد قدمت إليكم بالوعيد ما يبدل القول لدي وما أنا بظلام للعبيد يوم نقول لجهنم هل امتلأت وتقول هل من مزيد Do not dispute in my presence since I had already given you a warning my word cannot be changed nor am I unjust to my creation then Allah asked hellfire are you full yet and it responded are there any more after that, everyone knew that he couldn't blame the devil. Their leaders, their celebrities, their influencers, you can't blame anyone for your misguidance. A balance was made for everyone to weigh his good deeds against his sins. And everyone started reading his record. The record was so long. 
it took everyone years to read his record and everyone was asked about his life and how he consumed it minute by minute he was asked about his knowledge what did he do with it was it useful knowledge or not he was asked about his wealth how did he earn it and how did he dispose of it it's not only about earning and he was asked about his body how did he wear it out some people tried to lie tried saying to Allah no I didn't do all of these sins written in my record and this angel witness who is making testimony against me is a liar at this moment something amazing happened Allah ordered his mouth to shut up and he ordered his hands to talk his legs to talk his own body parts to testify against him اليوم نختم على أفواههم وتكلمنا أيديهم وتشهد أرجلهم بما كانوا يكسبون Then they started asking their skin furiously Why have you testified against us? And it said we have been made to speak by Allah Who causes all things to speak? He is the one who created you the first time And to him you are bound to return وقالوا لجلودهم لما شهدتم علينا قالوا أنطقنا الله الذي أنطق كل شيء وهو خلقكم أول مرة وإليه ترجعون Then they started to offer ransom as a last resort Take my children, take my wife, take my brother, take my whole family, take everything I owned but please forgive me But it was said to them No Indeed it is the flame of hell The remover of the exteriors It invites in he who turned his back on the truth and went away from obedience. يود المجرم لو يفتدي من عذاب يومئذ ببنيه وصاحبته وأخيه وفصيلته التي تؤويه ومن في الأرض جميعا ثم ينجيه كلا إنها لظى نزاعة للشوى تدعو من أدبر وتولى. At this time the criminals knew There was no way out. There was no escape from hellfire. Out of regret and fear, their eyes turned blue instead of white. They became blind. And everyone realized, believe it or not, that they would have to pass on top of hellfire. Everyone. And they will have to pass on a very, very thin wire called the Sirat. This wire extends all the way across hellfire. On one side, all humanity. And on the other side, paradise. And under it, hellfire. The problem was that this thin wire was sharper than a sword. The moment you touched it, it cuts you. Also, it had hooks, rotating hooks. One hook for every type of sin. For example, there was one hook that pulled down anyone who cut family ties. There is no way anyone could pass it except by the will of Allah. And everyone was asked to pass on it. وَإِن مِّنْكُمْ إِلَّا وَيَرِدُهَا كَانَ عَلَى رَبِّكَ حَتْمًا مَقْضِيًّا Allah gives the believers the strength they need to start the sirat. And also provided them with lights in their hands. They took the initiative and started passing on top of the Sirat, imagining the amazing destination waiting for them. The hypocrites followed them. Then I saw the hypocrites calling the believers from behind them. Wait for us. Let us share your lights. We don't have any lights of our own. We are afraid we might fall into hellfire. يوم يقول المنافقون والمنافقات للذين آمنوا انظرونا نقتبس من نوركم. قيل ارجعوا وراءكم فالتمسوا نورا فضرب بينهم بصور له باب باطنه فيه الرحمة وظاهره من قبله العذاب It was said mockingly Go back to the world Your first life And seek a light there Then a separating wall with a door was raised between them Within it it was mercy And outside of it is punishment ينادونهم ألم نكم معكم قالوا بلى ولكنكم فتنتم أنفسكم وتربصتم وارتبتم وغرتكم الأماني حتى جاء أمر الله وغركم بالله الغرور فاليوم لا يؤخذ منكم فدية ولا من الذين كفروا مأواكم النار هي مولاكم وبئس المصير The hypocrites called the believers Were we not with you? Weren't we living more or less the same lives? 
going to the same schools, doing the same jobs, eating the same food, sleeping on the same beds. Why is there a wall between us now? And what is this door? They replied, yes, we were together, but you afflicted yourselves and awaited misfortune for us and doubted Allah and wishful thinking deluded you until there came the command of Allah. And the deceiver, Satan, deceived you away from Allah. So today, no ransom will be accepted from you hypocrites, nor from the disbelievers. Your home is hellfire. It is the only fitting place for you. What a miserable destiny. And I saw how big hellfire is. I saw that for a man to fall into hellfire, it takes him 70 years just to fall to its bottom. I saw people whose tongues and lips being repeatedly cut by scissors of fire, then given new lips and then cut again, and then given new lips and then cut again. I asked Jibril, who are these people? He said, these are the people who advise others to do good and forget themselves. People who read the scripture but don't do what's in it. I saw people who had very long copper nails, scratching their own faces and chests with them. I asked Jibril, who are these people? He said, these are the people who were gossiping about others and accusing them in their honor. I saw people getting their heads repeatedly smashed by huge rocks, then fixed back to its original form, then smashed again, and so on. Those were the people who were not doing their prayers on time. I saw people in hellfire getting extremely hungry and ask for food. They were served something that looks like discharge of wounds. And even after they ate it, hunger didn't go away. I saw people wearing garments of fire hot liquid like molten lava being poured over their heads, melting their insides and their skins. And for them there were maces of iron. Whenever they tried to escape out of hell, they were forced back into it and were told, Taste the torment of burning. هذان خصمان اختصموا في ربهم فالذين كفروا قطعت لهم ثياب من نار يصب من فوق رؤوسهم الحميم يصهر به ما في بطونهم والجلود ولهم مقامع من حديد كلما أرادوا أن يخرجوا منها من غم أعيدوا فيها وذوقوا عذاب الحريق I saw people blaming Iblis for their destiny Satan until he rose and gave his final speech to everyone in hellfire. I was shocked by his speech. Iblis standing in the middle of hellfire and all the people in hell listening to him. He said, Indeed Allah has made you a true promise. I too made you a promise, but I failed you. I didn't have any authority over you. I only called you and you responded to me. So, do not blame me. Blame yourselves. I cannot save you, nor you can save me. Indeed, I denounce your previous association of me with Allah and loyalty. Surely the wrongdoers will suffer a painful punishment. وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَعَدَكُمْ وَعْدَ الْحَقِّ وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ وَمَا كَانَ لِي عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ إِلَّا أَنْ دَعَوْتُكُمْ فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ لِي فلا تلوموني ولوموا أنفسكم ما أنا بمصرخكم وما أنتم بمصرخي إني كفرت بما أشركتموني من قبل إن الظالمين لهم عذاب أليم Then I saw that death was brought in a form of a sheep in a place between hellfire and paradise so everyone will see it and it was said people of paradise, people of hell this is death, this sheep then the sheep got slaughtered. People of paradise, you will be there forever, no death. People of hell, you will be there forever, no death. Immortality for everyone. When the disciples of the Prophet heard all that, they were shocked. O Prophet of Allah, we try to be 100% perfect and never sin, but no matter how hard we try, we still slip. 
We're afraid. We sin every now and then. How can we ask Allah for mercy on us? We can't endure all that. He responded, No, 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 you don't understand. All of the things that I saw in my time travel journey to the hereafter were on the disbelievers and sinners' side. Do you know what I saw on the righteous servant's side? I saw the whole day of judgment pass in five minutes. Like a small prayer to rak'at. I saw a man celebrating in joy when he got his record in his right hand, running towards his family to show off his amazing score. I saw people passing the sirat like wind. I saw people passing the sirat like thunder. I saw that paradise has what no eyes have ever seen, no ears have ever heard, and no heart have ever imagined. I saw God's mercy surpassing everyone's expectations. I saw forgiveness after forgiveness after forgiveness. هذا ما توعدون لكل أواب حفيظ من خشى الرحمن بالغيب وجاء بقلب منيب ودخلوها بسلام ذلك يوم الخلود لهم ما يشاءون فيها ولدينا مزيد. It was said to them, This is what you were promised. For whoever constantly turns to Allah for repentance and kept his commandments, who feared the most merciful without seeing him, and came with a clean heart that always turned back to Allah after every slip. Enter paradise in peace. This is the day of eternal life. Here you will have whatever you desire, and we even have more. Before I go, I have two quick messages. First, a message for non-Muslims. What are you waiting for? Why aren't you reading the Quran, investigating whether it's from God or not? Why aren't you doubting what your society and media have been feeding you from your childhood? Why do you take their claims for granted? Why don't you keep the arrogance aside and read for yourself to see who is saying the truth and who is lying? Millions and millions of people every year are investigating the truth discovering how they have been lied to all their lives, discovering God, discovering the truth, and taking their shahada, starting their new lives as devout Muslims. And subhanallah, from my experience, they become even better than other Muslims. We see thousands of priests and preachers becoming Muslims every year. Hindus, Jews, atheists, agnostics, from every country, from every culture, every age group, Every ethnicity, everywhere around the world, people are finding God. What are you waiting for? If you have any questions regarding what we talked about, write them down in the comments below. I will make sure to answer each one of them, one by one. And if you need help reading and translating the Quran, join our group reading sessions on Discord. Link is in the description. The second message is for Muslims who are in ghafla who got stuck into dunya pursuing fleeting pleasures and worshipping their desires. God said in the Quran, chapter 4, verse 27, Wallahu yuridu an yatuba alaykum, wa yuridu alladheena yattabi'oona al-shahawati an tamilu maylan ghazima. Allah wants to accept your repentance and wants those who follow their desires to digress into a great deviation, to take a U-turn back to Him. God also said in Quran chapter 39 verse 53 Oh my servants who have exceeded their limits against their souls, do not lose hope in Allah's mercy, for Allah certainly gives forgiveness to all sins. He is indeed all forgiving, most merciful. And finally, Quran 57:16. Alam yani lil ladina amanu an taqshaa qulubuhum li dhikri Allah, wa ma nazal min al-haq, wa la yakunu kal ladina utu al-kitab min qabl fatala alayhim al-amad faqasat qulubuhum, wa kathir minhum fasiqun. Has the time not yet come for the believers' heart to be humbled at the remembrance of Allah and what has been revealed of the truth? and not be like those who were given the scripture before, those who were spoiled for so long that their hearts became hardened, and many of them are rebellious.
The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, deliver my message even if all you can deliver is one verse. Don't let this video stop with you. It might change someone's life for the better. Share it with your friends and also help it spread by engaging with it with likes and with comments. Also know that this video is copyright free. You have my permission to download it and re-upload it to your channel or anywhere you want. If you want to watch our series Women in Islam, check out this playlist up there. I am sure you'll like it. And if you want to watch more evidence of Islam videos like this one, check out this playlist down there. You will also find them linked in the description below. Thanks and Assalamu alaikum.